morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having us. And thanks for joining us this morning. It's, uh, this is, uh, I'm Gary Matsuoka. This is the Winnie Hills Nursery. And uh, our YouTube this morning is on Gary's Best Gardening. Thanks for joining us. So this is our main topic of, that we always talk about here is the fact that uh, the soil is not being discussed properly. How many of you have been to my soil class before? Okay, good. <laughs> so our subject today is what is good dirt and what's wrong with our industry because they're not using it. So if you look in the soil uh, textbook, this soils 101 or whatever you want to call it, beginning soil book, they will tell you that this is the soil. This is the sandy loam here is about as good soil. This is what any farmer would want, is sandy loam. The problem we're having is that we're being sold and told that this ground up wood, which is essentially a ground up dead rotten tree, essentially what that is, they're telling us that this is better than this. And it's totally wrong. But the industry, our industry is being told that this is what we should be growing plants in. So all the nurseries are trying to do what the academia is telling them and grow plants instead of in this, they're growing it in ground up wood. And it's killing them. It's Why? It's absolutely killing them. Well, it's like telling you if you're like this soil, this is almost pure quartz glass. It's a good home for the plants. This is a ground dead plant. Which one do you think the plant would rather grow in? If they're supposed to be growing in quartz, you think they'd really want to grow in a dead tree? Well, I don't know. I'm asking you. you know? Yeah. So that's the, that's the dilemma of our because no one's challenging academia. They're saying you've got to grow plants in dead plants. And the plants aren't making it, they're coming in, they're, they're actually rotting in the pots. And the reason for that, it's like telling you, okay, you should make your home filled with dead bodies. How do you live in there? How do you live in a home full of dead bodies? It doesn't work, there's too much disease going on. So they're, they miss the step. So this is an essential, the dead stuff, the compost, which is again, ground up dead, plants, I mean it could be animals too, but basically dead plants, is an essential part of the ecosystem of a plant. All the nourishment that plants get is from this, but they don't live here. This is not their home. This is the home of bacteria, fungi, earthworms, pill bugs. That's their home. The plants live in this. They don't live in this. They live in dirt. So. go back a little bit. So one of the first things that we were taught in school when we were kids, I don't know what they're teaching now, but uh, when we were kids, they taught us that, say, a typical tree had a root system that was a mirror image of the top of the tree. That's what we were taught. But it turns out that that's not true at all. Uh, generally, the root system of your tree is a, most of it is less than a foot deep. Very few roots go below a foot. Um, and the reason for that is what the plants need. So we're going to put down what roots need. So what the roots need from the ground Number one, uh, they do need water. <coughs> the typical plant, the leaves are almost waterproof. They have little holes in them that open and close as they need to get in carbon dioxide, let out oxygen, and the water escapes at that time. But the top of the plant is fairly waterproof. The roots are not. They need to be surrounded by moist soil at all times. If the plant's operating, the roots need the water. And if you pull this plant out of the pot, shake off all the soil, uh, set it outside in, the, in a warm sunny day, it can be dead within a couple hours. The roots are totally dry, the plant wilts totally, 
and it's gone. So the one thing, the main thing that the soil, the number one thing that soil has to provide for its plant is water storage. Not as important as it used to be. Back in 1800s, before we had irrigation, we had the soil had to be very good at water storing. Today we've got all this technology we can apply the water when we need it. Number two is oxygen or gas exchange. So it turns out the only part of a plant that makes oxygen are the green chloroplasts inside the green parts of the plant. The rest of the plant, the flowers, the roots, everything else, the stems, they're consuming oxygen just like we do. They do the same thing. In order for us to live, we combine carbon dioxide, I mean oxygen with sugar <clears throat> to make carbon dioxide and water. And that's our energy supply and plants operate the same way. So the chloroplasts create sugars from carbon dioxide and water and the rest of the plant consumes oxygen to turn the sugars back into water and carbon dioxide. So the roots have to breathe oxygen in order to make it. They don't make, they don't make their own oxygen. So plants do not, you know, like we have um, a circulation system. Our blood circulates the oxygen from our lungs to the rest of our body. Plants don't have that. So the oxygen comes out of the holes in the leaves, out into the atmosphere, through the soil, to the roots. So one reason roots can't live very far down is because the air doesn't penetrate far enough. So in a typical city, one foot deep. I mean, when you see pictures of trees getting uplifted in the rain or after a wind, this much soil comes up. I mean, everybody keeps asking for deep root trees. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a tap root. Uh, I've dug up trees with trunks this big, never found roots deeper than about a foot and a half. That's as deep as I've seen. So, so they're all the same? Pretty much. Is there any complaints about the ficus trees tearing up everything, you know? Yeah, ficus trees have very surface oriented roots. That's why ficus can live in really bad conditions, because ah. the roots, yeah. roots are at the top of the ground. They, don't need to, they can breed better there, yeah. so they can live in real junky soil. So anyway, um, the average root system of, a, say, a tree, they said is between three and 20 times wider than the tree is tall. So that's what a tree does. And most bush, old bushes do that too. They grow their roots way out there. We'll talk about the reason for that uh, next week. But uh, so this is a typical plant. Um, number three is insulation. The roots operate between about, say, 45 degrees and 85. They do not like to be above 85 degrees. They do not like to be below 30, 45 degrees. They won't operate well. So the soil does insulate them. Um, of course, it's also very stable. It holds the plants upright. We've kind of left off. I would say no longer do I put nutrition right here. Because most plants do not use the soil for nutrition. That was uh, um, observation made by University of California Davis. They went around the Central Valley uh, on the different soils, just surveying what plants live there. Their, their uh, conclusion was that plants do not use the soil for food because the soils they were surveying had had didn't have enough in them. They weren't that wasn't the source of their nutrition. The soil itself is not the source of nutrition. Most plants recycle dead stuff. So the soil we want to give to plants, we want to be able to provide these things. It's hard to do that with something that's died and is decomposing. So this dead stuff is breaking down and slowly disappearing back to carbon dioxide and water. Um, there are people who tell me, well, I make finished compost. Well, finished compost is carbon dioxide and water, but you can't sell finished compost. Well, you could, I guess, carbon <coughs> dioxide and water. If you breathe on someone, you're, that's finished, essentially the same as finished compost. 
So there is nothing, so this, as long as this has still got some, some body to it, it's decomposing. And when it's decomposing, it's using up oxygen, giving off carbon dioxide. It's not where the roots want to be. They want more oxygen than this. <laughs> so let's show you first what this soil is about. So get a better pen. plants live in, they usually call loam. And there's a lot of terms that in journalism, horticultural journalists, they get it wrong all the time. So they keep telling you, oh, you want a rich loam, add compost to it till it's nice and rich. Well, that's not what rich loam is. So loam, all loam means is that the soil contains the three main components of soil which are sand, silt, and clay. So you all know what sand is, you've been to the beach. You all know what clay is, clay is like modeling clay in elementary school. Silt is smaller chunks of sand, so sand, let's blow it up a little bit, is a fairly round piece of rock, primarily quartz. If you melt sand, Glass. Glass is quartz, sand is basically quartz. Um, and if you when you when sand gets chipped, the smaller particles of sand are silt. So it's quartz also. Now, one way to tell you what soil is, now I'm not sure if this is pure granite, it might be metamorphosized granite, but uh, a granite rock is what is chopped up to make soil loam. So the lighter parts of granite are quartz, silicon dioxide, quartz. So the lighter parts of a granite rock become the sand and the silt. The darker parts of a quartz, the uh, silicon is combined along with oxygen with um, iron, which makes it reddish, or aluminum, which makes it more dark. So the darker spots in this piece of granite then become Clay. When this thing breaks down, the clay is real tiny and flaky, whereas sand and silt are larger and rounder pieces. The clay, so the darker spots in, in uh, granite are called feldspar, and that becomes the clay. So clay are little tiny flakes of quartz or silicon dioxide combined instead of with this oxygen with other minerals, and they come out different shapes. So that's your soil. That's how you make good dirt. Um, generally, before it goes to the riverbed, they call it decomposed granite. And once the river gets done with it, all the parts come out more rounded, and you get a nice loam. So that's the difference between decomposed granite and loam as it's been through the river. So you've got sand, silt, and clay. So loam has all three parts. Um, this is kind of a demonstration. So the sizes are off. If the sand was in here, it would be represented by bowling balls, which are a little bit bigger. Bowling balls or beach balls. The silt would be the little ping pong balls because they're still rounded. And then these lentil seeds would be the clay. I would tell you, well, confetti might be a better representation. It's more flat. But if you have fairly round pieces, and if you look at sand underneath the microscope, pieces are fairly round. Um, the gap between round spheres, solid spheres, is 33%. So it's 66%. If you have pure sand, 66% rock, quartz, 33% airspace, and the spaces are big. So when you have big spaces between rocks, they call that, they tell you that the soil is quite permeable. So what that means is that the airflow is very good through big particles of sand. Sand is a very permeable soil. The air flows easily through sand. Silt not quite as good. The pieces are smaller. Clay, the 
pieces are so small, even though clay has more air spaces than sand does, the smaller the particles, the more space there is between them. This, the gaps are so tiny, the air has a lot of trouble getting through there. It's like the filter is too fine. So clay is very, is less permeable. Sand is very highly permeable, that's the airflow. As far as how these things hold water, if you take soil out of the ground that's decently moist, it doesn't be wet, just de decently moist, you'll look at it in the microscope and you'll notice that all the particles gleam because they've got stuck to them one layer of water molecules that adhere very tightly to the outside of each particle. And that's because um, quartz has got a negative charge and water is ionic. Ionic water, that means it's off water on one side of the molecule, it's H2O. Uh, it's got oxygen. Two hydrogens, the hydrogens are positive, the oxygens are negative, two negatives. So the molecule is lopsided. The positive hydrogen side sticks to these particles really hard. So it's really hard to get the last bit of water, but the water is attracted to these particles because of that charge. That's why soil holds water, is because these are charged particles and so is water. Clay, being the smallest particle, has the most surface area. So every time you make something, if you have something that's half as the diameter, but you have four times as many particles, you've doubled the surface area that you that's in that area. So every time you make the particle half the size, you double the surface area. So clay's got a lot of surface area. So if you have, what they know is that if you have, now of course there's different sizes of sand. If you have typical sand, one foot of it, it takes about a half inch of water to wet all that sand so the water drips out to the bottom. So about a, a foot of sand will hold about a half inch of water. If you have a foot of clay, it'll hold about three times that much. It takes one and a half inches of water to totally saturate all the clay until it drips out the bottom. So that's why uh, clay holds water better than sand. It's just got so many little pockets in there. So they, we call that the porosity of the soil. So the more pore spaces and I always hear this wrong in the journalists too. They say, oh, you want to use a clay pot, it's more porous, the air goes through better. No, that's not what that means. Porous means it holds water better. The clay pots are very porous. They suck up the water. They don't, you know, they have to breathe too because they're porous, but it's, it's not the airflow they're talking about. Porosity means the ability to hold water Clay is more porous than sand. It's like blotter paper, it just sucks that water right up. So we need these three particles to make good soil. The clay holds the water, sand holds the air. It turns out that the space between the clay and the silt is 33%. And it turns out if your soil is more than 33% clay, you've filled up all the gaps between the sand and silt and the soil doesn't breathe. So the definition of clay soil is soil that contains more than 35% clay. Doesn't need much to block up the air passages. So we know the sandy, the, the hills in Orange County, coastal hills, these hills back here, they call it sandy clay. So it's clay soil, it's got a lot of sand in it, the clay content is just high enough to fill all these gaps. So it's about, and we've seen about, like in the hills, uh, Laguna Niguel, 40% clay. Now, the way you check that, this is kind of a, a coarse test. It's not perfectly accurate, but if you take this soil and fill a main empty mayonnaise jar about half full, add water to the neck, few drops of dish soap, shake it up really good, get all the clods, the dirt clods to break up into their basic particles, and then set it down, um, the bigger particles settle first. So 
so the sand all drops to the very bottom and it takes a whole day for the clay to settle down. The clay looks like grease, so if I take this jar and swirl a little bit, you can kind of see the clay coming off the very top surface of that. So this is this soil from the farm. It might be five to eight percent clay in there. And then sand looks like it comes up to about here. The difference between sand and silt is minor because they're both round particles, so it's hard to tell where it stops, but I would tell you that this soil off this farm in Irvine uh, is about 75 to 8% sand and about 8% clay and the rest of it's silt. And a farmer who's a friend of mine who was the state ag commissioner, so he knows what he's talking about. He says this farm was the best soil he's ever farmed on. And it's almost all sand. In fact, uh, you know, we talked to some of the strawberry farmers at the farmer's market, and they've got some land along the Santa Ana River, and they said, boy, this is really rich soil. I can grow strawberries really well. well it's just pure sand. Those roots breathe so well. The plants are really vigorous. They grow real well. It's not that they contain any nutrients at all. Soil basically doesn't have enough nutrients to grow crop. It basically does not. So then how do they get, do they need nutrients? Oh yeah. It doesn't come from the dirt. You water it in? Well you add it. Farmers add the nutrients. Now in nature there is one way, there's a different way that they get started. We'll talk about that more next week, but there are a class of plants called the pioneer plants. So these are the plants that come in and they can get enough stuff out of this. Usually they're, we call them weeds. Yeah. So the grasses, uh, there's a bunch of plants that are in the Brassaceae family, mustards. They have incredible root systems that can really mine the soil and gather what they need. So in every type of soil in Orange County, there's a certain weed that specializes in that soil. So they grow there first They'll gather up the nutrients. There's not many of them out there, so they'll gather up the nutrients from a large area. And as soon as they start making dead stuff on top of the ground, the other plants come and take that. And the way that happens, so about 1960, I think, uh, the guys with the electron microscopes found out that 80% of the roots of a typical woody plant, tree, shrub, are no heads roots at all. There are fungus that's attached to them called a mycor whoops, mycor mycorrhizal. So it's a it's a plant symbiotic plant partner that attached to most plants when they first came on the land how many billion years ago? <laughs> I don't recall, I can't remember now, but they said when plants first came to land, when algae first started to, to uh, colonize the rocks on land, they couldn't get the minerals out of it. This fungus can do it. Um, and this fungus, but the fungus wanted some help. So what they did is the plant roots uh, provide the fungus with more sugar that the plant makes in the leaves from solar the solar cells and the fungus body is mostly cellulose. Cellulose, which is wood, couldn't bring a piece of wood in here, but uh, wood <coughs> on a plant, cellulose is sugar. It's just a sugar molecule that's rearranged so we can't eat it. The only thing they can eat, um, cellulose is bacteria. So anything that can consume cellulose and actually use it have bacteria. So uh, cows have bacteria in the guts. Uh, beavers have bacteria, uh, termites have the same bacteria in their guts, or is it protozoa? I think the protozoa has the bacteria inside of it, but certain things in their guts that can actually break down cellulose and turn it back into sugar. So there's a way this mycorrhizal fungus gets the sugar from the plant to make its own body. It consumes the dead leaves on top of the ground and then returns them to the plant that's attached to so plants, most plants, they said 95% plants 
of nature uses fungus to gather nutrients from the dead leaves. And the rest of them have incredible root systems that can do it on their own. So most of the grasses, a few other plants have incredible root systems that can uh, gather the nutrients that they need. A few of them, uh, like the legumes, their root systems house bacteria that create fertilizer, create nitrogen from the atmosphere. So, so there are some pioneer plants that make the initial um, source of nutrients on top of the ground, and then all the plants coming in later are mine. Of course, you know, the contribution to this layer up here is bird droppings, uh, animal feces, all that stuff happens. The, even lightning can create nitrogen that contributes. So, but in general, the pioneer plants started off, and then once the other plants come in, the pioneer plants disappear and the other plants just keep recycling the dead leaves. So the soil itself has very little to do with nutrition to the plants that we want to grow. This year, that our food is no good anymore because the soil is so depleted of nutrients. It never had any. Mm. That's <laughs> the thing. Yeah. yeah. So the soil really never had many nutrients to begin with. Um, all that talk they tell you, well, is you know that's kind of well we you know there's they, we talk about it actually. I mean there's 17 minerals that plants are made of, maybe 18, and we know what exactly what they are. We you know we can always apply them. You can't. All you have to do is put dead leaves in the ground. You've got every single mineral the plant needs. You're so not too much of anything. a clean garden or too much weeding is not good. Right. Plants want the dead stuff. That's that's the way they normally recycle. But that's next week. So oh. this week we'll keep talking about dirt. So the ideal soil. Um, we'll put down. What do you want as far as sand, silt, and clay? So this sandy loam that farmers really like is going to be around 60%, maybe higher sand. Clay is going to be less than 30%, but I would say if you want sandy loam, then your clay is probably going to be about 10% or less, and then maybe 30% silt. So if you have this kind of soil, and this in Orange County, this soil is below the hills uh, before you get too far to the ocean. So the rivers bring the soil, all this sandy clay from the hills, down from the hills. The first thing that settles out because it's a bigger, heavier particle is the sand. So you get a lot of sand below the hills. So below these hills, like in Tustin here, to the five freeway, you get really good sandy soil. Uh, the North Irvine, real sandy soil. You can dig 10 feet down with a shovel, it's really nice. But as the rivers carry it further out to the ocean, the rivers slow down, the clay kind of settles out. So you're in Fountain Valley, you're in parts of Costa Mesa, it's clay. Unless you're right near the riverbed where there's a lot of sand, you have clay soil. So our hills are sandy clay, that's normal, because well, they were, from the ocean bottom and raised up. That's how we got these hills. Uh, and out in the ocean, there's a lot of clay below the riverbeds. It's, it's a mixture of sand and clay. I mean, when I lived in Mission Bayo, um, it used to be the ocean bottom. So we were in solid clay, but three door houses down, it was solid sand. It was the beach that got raised up there. Our house had uh, snail fossils. It was the ocean bottom where the clay was. So that's how they got that. But then as the rivers wash it back out, yeah, the clay goes further out the river to the ocean. Now, what's it really interesting is before World War I, the farmers were in Fountain Valley. They weren't here in Irvine. They were in Fountain Valley because the clay soil is considered the rich soil. You have that high clay content soil holds the water because they didn't have irrigation back in those days. You know, Mr. Mulholland had hadn't created the aqueducts or the river uh, water systems in LA, Orange County yet. So 
uh, they had to depend on the rainwater and the soil retain the water, so they wanted that clay soil. That was rich farmland was the clay. Well, as soon as we got irrigation going around World War II or so, suddenly Irvine becomes a better farmland because it's got sandier soil, plants grow faster, the roots breathe better, uh, but as long as you water it, this will grow a plant faster. That the limitations would be water and then air. Well, if you have enough water, the air is a limitation on the roots, and then you just water more often, and you got lots of air in the ground. That's great. Got mosquito. We have, do have mosquitoes in here. So, um, so that's so that's sandy loam. So it's a rich loam. Clay content's going to be about 25 percent. Maybe it might be 50, 50. That's going to be about what, 16, 25. So something like that. If you want a rich loam, anything above 35 percent clay is going to be considered a clay soil. It only takes a little bit of clay to mess up your dirt. You can have. 60% sand, but your clay content's 40%. You've got sandy clay. That's still the air won't get through there. But clay's not poisonous. Back in the 60s, we grew plants in all the different soils equally well. Uh, nowadays, we're having trouble in the clay soils because the growers grow plants in compost, and compost doesn't work well on clay. Compost is consuming the oxygen. So the roots, you put this plant in sandy soil, the roots can still breathe pretty good because the sandy soil is allowing the air to. You put this in clay, and suddenly there's no more airflow. The air, the air holes in the bottom aren't there in clay. So the clay won't give it any oxygen. The roots can't get any oxygen because the compost is using it up. The plant just rots. What's the benefits between the two? Why would you want a rich farm? That's what a farmer used to want. Only if you don't have enough water. Basically. Right. Now they all okay. want sandy. I mean, this is what farmers want now. They want a good sandy loam soil because the plants grow faster. Okay. But if we're doing a crop condition, we might rather have rich soil. Mm -hmm. Do you have to wash? Uh, the technology is so good now, it doesn't really make any difference. I mean, the one thing about sand versus clay. so. Sand holds about a third of the water clay does, but because sand breathes so much better, the roots can grow three times deeper. So it's, it's kind of a wash. Okay. Initially, there's a problem with sand holding enough water, but eventually there's no difference because the root systems are larger in sand than they are, are deeper in sand than they are in clay. So once they're established. Right, once they're established, there's, the sand is actually the better place to be in. It's just initially uh, clay holds water near the surface better. So how do you know what your soil is made up of, the percentages? Like if I go home, I do that mm -hmm. experiment? It's pretty good. I mean, the clay is pretty distinct. <laughs> okay. So the clay looks like gravy on top of the sand and the silt. Okay. And if your clay layer is like that, you got a lot of clay in it. Now, the other way to tell is just, you just take your wet soil. If you can make a little sausage out of the cold beyond an inch, well, there's a lot of clay in there if you can make, if you can do that with the soil, wet soil. If it just keeps breaking off, that sand, the sand won't do that. Sand, you try to make a little sausage out of it, just keeps falling apart. Would the compost make the sausage? If there's yeah, compost? but you don't want the compost. I know, but I have a raised bed. It's already in there. Well, compost becomes sludge-like as it ages, so it eventually it make it hold to stick together. But you don't want the compost to do that because there's, when you have compost around, you don't have any oxygen. Yeah. You've got plenty of nutrition, no oxygen. So okay. you sell sand then to add to our beds? Well, there's something that's, sand can work. So we were told by an egg agent that the clay content in Orange County is not too high, that you can take any clay, any clay soil in Orange County, if you mix it with equal parts of sand, you will drop the clay content below 30%. So that means that, uh, or below, yeah, below 30%. So that means there's not much more than 50% clay in the soils of Orange County. So if you add equal amounts of sand, that soil's going to breathe. Okay. You won't.
don't make concrete. You need cement to make concrete. Uh, people tell you this, these silly things that don't know anything about dirt. So all soils need clay, they need sand, they need, you know, the silt is actually optional, but sand and, and clay make our soils what they are. What the plant needs, to put it that way. Um, and again, there's nothing wrong with clay as long as you don't have the compost going in. Now to improve soil, nature has a way of making soil more permeable. And what happens as dead things decompose, so that the dead stuff is mainly silos fibers, the wood fibers, that are glued together in plants by some a natural glue the plant makes out of sugar called lignin. So lignin holds the silos together to make the wood. When the plants decompose, the silos is eaten. Lignin, nothing eats lignin. So you got this plant glue now that free, the glue soil particles together. So as the things decompose on the surface, this lignin is gluing all the particles, the little tiny particles of sand, silt, and clay into bigger chunks. So it can take clay and turn it into sand, essentially. It's what the lignin is doing. So if you put a lot of dead stuff on top of the ground and wait a few months right underneath it, you'll notice that the, the soil is killing up, it's beating up. So it's changing the soil into a more permeable soil. As, so if you put a lot of compost or dead stuff on top of the ground and just leave it there, water so it's moist, then that improves the quality of soil below it. So the people who study this say that the mycorrhizal fungus, which are on the plants, on the roots of the trees nearby. So all the roots and we'll draw the fungus in the red, say. They're scratching the ground and then the lignin is beating it up. So you have the structure of beady soil particles held together with these all these strands of mycorrhizal fungi and plant roots. And they said it's very, very sturdy, and just like Swiss cheese. And you have uh, microscopic worms, and now earthworms are not native to the U.S. apparently, so all the worms, the big worms you can see are, were brought in from Europe. Um, they're, you know, truthfully, earthworms do as much bad as they do good, so they're considered neutral. But, you know, they say if you don't have worms, don't bring them in. They're not native to our ecosystem. And in the Midwest, they said that they're losing parts of the natural ecosystem because the worms are, are, are messing it up. They're messing up the flow of energy. So anyway, the worms, big and little, make holes through all this. It's just like Swiss cheese. So the airflow is real good through there. They said it's very sturdy. You can run a truck over that and it won't collapse it once the, the, the root system is in there and the mycorrhizal so that's how nature makes real good soil. So you can kind of do that just by putting mulch on top of your clay. Putting what on top of clay? Mulch. 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 Some kind of organic mulch on top of the clay. <coughs> and, and waiting a little while. It works pretty fast. I mean, they know that uh, the mycorrhizal fungus can break down a plant leaf in not about 90 days. Okay, so if you get a good plant from us, now let's assume that the plants you're getting are perfect plants. The one big problem we have is that plant roots only grow 8 inches, 10 inches, maybe 12 inches deep because they breed. Well, a lot of the plants we sell you are in pots that are bigger than that. Say a 15-gallon tub, that's 15 inches deep. So what do you do to keep that alive? Or let's go with the 24 inch boxes. Back in 2000, the US Department of Agriculture, which knows, who knows, you know, they know something. They told us how to treat box trees properly. So if you have a box tree with a root system that's about 20, 22 inches deep. It's really too deep. So the air normally gets down about a foot, you're gonna lose 
tap your root system before the tree gets going. So you put a big box screen ground, you don't compensate. It starts to decline a bit before it recovers, makes roots near the surface, and then it gets going again. So if you don't want to get that decline, you've got to do something to get the air down to the bottom. Usually we make a hole that's the same depth. We don't like to go deeper than the container. If you make a hole deeper than this and you water it once, and this is soft dirt underneath here, the mud squishes out, the tree drops another few inches, and it's too deep. You want to make sure that the surface of this root ball is at the very surface, or even just a bit higher than the surrounding ground. Uh, the soil, I'll go back a bit. So in containers, Difference between container soil and, and, the, and the nursery soil, and I forgot to bring one more visual display in here, is that this soil has got to be coarser than real dirt. When I was a kid, my dad grew everything in sandy loam, which is almost pure sand, but not all the plants will live in a pot in sandy loam because it holds a lot of water, compared to say, pure, pure sand holds less water than sandy loam does. So the coarseness of the soil makes it hold less water. It's like clay holds the most water. If you have a block of clay that's a foot high and it's wet, it's shiny to the top, it's saturated. When things are shiny, that means there's water that's filled all the gaps. With, so it gives you a gleam. So clay will stay totally saturated a foot high easily. Even several feet high, clay just holds that water. It won't let it go. Sand only holds about two or three inches of water. If you had a pile of sand, the bottom two or three inches may be saturated, but the top of it won't hold it. It doesn't have enough uh, porosity. So the water just kind of drains out to the bottom a couple inches. So that happens in a pot. If you've got too much clay in this pot, the water table is too high. And if it sits there too long, so, okay, I gotta go back a little more. So drainage is kind of overrated. Plants can live in water. Overwatering is a term that was invented by people who grew plants in, in compost and had a problem with them rotting. So they're telling you that overwatering, you know, like the industry is telling us, overwatering is the biggest problem with growing plants. And I'm thinking, can't be. Overwatering with that much problem, all the plants on Houston would be dead right now. They've been underwater for three or four days now, they'd be dead. Um, oxygen and Water's got oxygen in it. So the water industry knows how much oxygen's gotta be in that tap water so that they won't kill the fish, they won't kill plants when you add water. So it's, it's six to eight parts per million is the amount of oxygen they put in tap water. Six to eight parts per million. I should have done this first. So different plants do have different requirements for oxygen. We know that things like conifers, and grasses. Oh, so grasses and conifers could probably get by on about two or three percent. They don't need as much air. They they respire. So, you know, they're just more tolerant. Uh, same with lilies. With day lilies, they can live in really bad sewage conditions. They don't need much air or oxygen around their roots as do daisies. So the daisy family can get by without much oxygen. The other plants need a lot of oxygen, so gardenias, uh, English lavender, uh, avocados, blueberries, they rot real easy because they need more air in the ground. It's not the water. It's definitely not the water. So we know avocado is one of the is probably the main crop that needs the best quote draining soil because they rot the easiest of all the major crops. So avocados need the best land, usually it's the hills where the water drains real well. But almost everybody in this room has probably grown an avocado pit in a glass of water. Absolutely no drainage in that water. Uh, they'll sit in there for a year and be totally healthy. And the reason is that if you have clean water and it's free to circulate in glass, the water is well oxygenated. It'll hold plenty of oxygen. If you put it in clay soil, the water circulates very poorly, 
and eventually the roots use up the oxygen as they're breathing and then your oxygen level drops off. So if you have clay soil and the water sits there too long, then it runs out of oxygen. The worst thing you do is you put dead stuff in the water and once you put finely ground up dead stuff in the water, it's like two days later you use up all the oxygen and the thing stinks like a sewer because it's, it's, it's decomposing with no oxygen. It creates that sewer condition. So it doesn't take much dead stuff. I mean, if you just a tablespoon of dead stuff in a gallon of water will probably make it stink within a week. Uh, when it's that fine the ground, there's so much surface area on this dead stuff. Like if you put a block of wood in the water, nothing happens. But if you take that block of wood and you cut it into a million pieces, and then you put it in water, that water will turn black and stink really fast because it's decomposing way faster than a solid block of wood would. Compost is like death to water. <laughs> it really ruins it. So if you've got compost in the ground, then uh, or compost near your roots, you have to make sure that they're getting a lot of air to it. So we have on this side, like here's a plant, and we have a lot of trouble with boxwood, and this is a symptom of root rot. Branches are dying one by one. And that's not because of water, it's because there's not enough oxygen around the root. It's almost any plant you can grow hydroponically, just in water, as long as water's clean, uh, it's got plenty of oxygen in it. Now root rot usually occurs in the summer months because hot water holds less oxygen than cold water does. Rain water and cool water actually have more oxygen in them because when, you, when water gets hotter, you know when it boils all the oxygen is out of there. So, so I, I worry a little bit about people who have the um, big water storage tanks where they're holding their, their uh, used uh, dishwash water or their used bath water. Uh, if it heats up too much in the day, you can lose a lot of oxygen there. And if, but if you sprinkle it when you're using it, then it reoxygenates the water and it's fine. And that's next week's our subject. We'll get back to the floor. Anyway, so the roots need oxygen down here. What the egg department said to do is put in big perforated drain, uh, big perforated pipes on all sides, about a foot apart. Fill with gravel so that stays, airflow stays there. Do not amend the soil. They, they warned, do not amend the soil. Amendment's not good for the dirt. So at least someone knows what they're doing. So put the big air pipes around here. So for a long time we did that. We still lost a lot of trees because, you know, the growers don't like dirt in there. So, but anyway, that's the best way to do to larger plants or else surround them with a lot of sand. So uh, they said when the LA airport was being built in the 1980s or when they were making that new terminal in the 1980s before the Olympics, they were installing a lot of palm trees and big plants out of you know, huge boxes. And they had, they said it was real odd looking because they had cement mixtures right with the, work, the crude. They were pumping wet sand into the holes around those plants just to make sure they had the air. So those people knew what they were doing. A friend of mine who was a contractor for decades and still is, says, yeah, when he plants plants, he always surrounds them with pure sand. He never loses anything. So that's one way to do it, is just don't get, don't use, quote, planter mix that's made out of dead plants. Use sand. Are you talking the sand like the ones you buy at the, at the hardware store yeah. for your kids? Uh, well, yeah, clay sand, sand is fine. Sand. It's it's more expensive than you need to have. I mean, washed sand, masonry sand of some kind, plaster sand, concrete sand, it's all good. But I've used clay sand just to see if it works. It's still the same. Costs more because they heat sterilize it, so when the kids eat it, they don't get sick. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, surround your plants with sand; it works. Um, the main thing, if you're planting, is you've got to make a basin to catch the water, especially in the summertime. This is vital. You got to make a basin to hold the water right at the edge of the root ball, because if you don't, the water will just soak up over here and this being coarser soil in here 
won't absorb the water. The water gets absorbed this direction, not this way. So if you don't have a nice basin right at the edge of the root hole of your plant, and it's 90 degrees that day, your plant's using water very quickly right here, the roots aren't here yet, it would dry up. You gotta have this basin around it so that the water goes straight through here before it gets sucked out that way. In the winter, plants don't use much water. Turns out that plant water usage it drops to zero right around 55 degrees. So in the winter time or in the evening, uh, plants hardly need any water. In that case, if you got this area wet, most it'll probably absorb enough this way for the plant to stay alive in the winter time. That's why, that's one of the reasons they say don't transplant in summer. Well, as long as you know that you've got water right here, not over here, there's no issue. Summer, I like planting in the summer because the plants grow faster, the roots grow faster, and there's no wind. Wind is the worst thing. You put a tree in and then you get a 70 mile hour Santa Ana, forget it. Summer has the least amount of breezes for us, it seems. Like all the other seasons, we get this nasty wind that can mess up the plant. So anyway, that's one way to plant. Uh, now, if you don't want to use sand, you can just add something to the soil to make it breathe better. It turns out the most efficient way to make sense, uh, clay soil breathe better is pumice rock. So pumice rock is quartz, same as sand, but the volcano blew a lot of gases through it, so it's very, very permeable. Uh, pumice rock is 70% air, whereas sand is, is uh, 33% air, this is 70% air, so a lot more air spaces in pumice. Um, back, well, the soil that we sell to our contractors and customers as a planter mix actually is our acid mix. So this material here is 50% pumice and 50% peat, which makes a little more acidity, which is also good for plants, a lot of the plants that we grow. So a lot of our contractors use this as planter mix. Um, we do sell pure bags of pure pumice. So if you want to get the real thing, just pure this. Now what the research shows is that if you had 100% clay, and we don't, there's no such thing as 100% clay in Orange County, but if you did have 100% clay, like in the modern, you know, the modern clay in elementary school, if you make it 20% pumice by volume, you will have rock to rock contact in there and the air will get through. So, so I don't feel comfortable with 20%, I'd rather do half and half. Half and half, okay. And even with this, and so in our soils, which are less than 50%, are usually 50% or less clay, half and half with their acid mix uh, should be enough to break it up or make it breathe. Not going to make it drain better. You can't make soil drain better at all um, by adding things to it. It's like telling you, okay, you got a swimming pool. I can make it drain by throwing rocks in it. No, that doesn't work. So you can't add anything to the soil to make it drain better. All you can do to create better drainage is to raise it up. So if you took heavy clay soil and raise it up a foot. water wants to get sucked down to the original level of the soil. So raising the soil up makes it, makes the water get sucked downwards and the air comes back in after it. So in Irvine where they grow, you know, strawberries need really good drainage, really good drainage, or real good airflow. So in Irvine where the soil is sandy, they still raise the beds 18 inches. See the workers over there, they got these 18 inch berms, they got strawberry plants here. So the guys just have to reach down this far to pick the strawberries at about knee level. And now along the central California coast where they grow all hordes of strawberries that are harvested in the summer months, they raise their beds three feet high. Because it's clay over on those on the coast, near the coast, Monterey area. That little valley further up from Monterey. It's all clay up there. So, you know, you look at the videos of these farms in Central Coast and they have kids running through their fields. You see the tops of their heads. 
because they have they raise the clay up three feet, twice as high as they do in Irvine because the soil has got more clay in it. They do cover with plastic so that it doesn't wash away. Uh, clay washes away in water. Sand does, you know, it's, it's hard to move sand. If you pile sand up, you know, you just blast water, it doesn't move. It just sucks it up. The clay moves, so they cover with plastic. So if you raise up that clay, it still breathes. So you can raise up soil to make it breathe better. Um, you can add sand or pumice to it to make the air go in better. It just won't get rid of the excess water. Now plants can hold their breath longer than we can. So, you know, humans, four or five minutes is it. Uh, the avocado trees, they want the water to drain away within two days. If the water sits there more than two days, they're, they're, they don't have enough oxygen. So plants can hold their breath way longer than people can, but still they eventually don't want the water to sit there too long. Well, the problem we have is the quality of the plants that you're getting. Let's so if you here. okay, so <laughs> from us, yeah, you just dig a hole, drop it in. If from any other grower, you got to fix the root ball before you drop it in there because it's going to rot. So that's the big problem we're up against is that the nursery industry is not providing us with good plants. Um, I've complained for decades about this, but because I don't have the PHB, they ignore me. Uh, now, recently, I emailed with this professor from UC Berkeley, Gabalik, I don't want to pronounce his name wrong. Um, I won't try. It's, it's Italian. Uh, but he was in charge, I think it was the Department of Forestry or something. They were trying to figure out why all the, um, the replanting of the native plants along the highways was failing. He said, we're having root rot all over the place. Native plants aren't working. And so I emailed him, I said, this is what my thought, that the plants are coming in the wrong growing medium, so they're rotting. He says, yeah. He, he, ans he answered, he says, yes, the plants have root rot the day we get them from the growers. It, was it Paul Lick? No. Uh, his name was Gabalik. But anyway, um, so he concurs that the worst thing to do in the world is to grow plants in dead trees. Because that's what all the growers are thinking they have to do is, you know, we had one grower who was having so much trouble, what they did is put bigger chunks of wood in there. <laughs> Less rot. As, as, their, as their cure for root rot, they put bigger pieces. Uh, so it's just hilarious that they just won't go back to sandy dirt. If they put them in pure sand, nothing would rot. Is it too heavy to move? No, but it's just because the whole industry is geared toward using compost as soil. Mm -hmm. I've been told face to face by professors that you cannot grow plants in dirt. You've got to grow them in compost because the research they've been handed down to them, the research they base everything on, shows that for the three months it takes to grow a plant in a container, compost works better than dirt. They don't look at the, you know, there's another piece of research out there uh, that says, okay, you've got five months to do this. So after you compost the bark, you got to compost, because if you just put it in there fresh, it just gets too hot in there. It's decomposing. So you have, you, get, you compost it for three months, then you've got five months to grow the plant and sell it. By the eighth month, the bark is becoming a toxic medium. It's breaking down too far, the permeability is dropping too low, it's creating sewer gas, and it's going to become a bad place. So the, the growers have to either sell it, move it to a bigger pot with fresh uh, compost, or throw it away. So it gets sold and it dies in people's yards, so they never know about it. You know, that's the problem with the industry now. I mean, we're still a grower retail. We sell the plants, we sell a lot of plants that we grow. So we hear the feedback. The big growers, they 
They don't hear that their plants died this year or next year or five years down the road. They never hear it. I've talked to the guys at the top of the industry and they don't think it's a problem. They never hear it from consumers that the plants have died this year, the following year, three years down the road. I mean, when we did planter a house 20 years, our first last house we bought uh, 25 years ago, we used the same plants from about five different growers throughout our yard. Uh, two of the growers' plants never died. One grower's plants, every plant I got from them died almost to the day three years after I planted them. Another grower it was five years, uh, another grower was 10 years, but two growers, none of their plants died, and it turns out two, two growers, one used no wood product, it was just peat moss and sponge rock. And the other grower used uh, redwood compost and sand. Now redwood, the advantage that redwood has, it's not the greatest growing medium, I wouldn't use it, but redwood decomposes really slowly. It's the slowest decomposing organic matter other than rice holes that we know of. So it, it didn't cause trouble with the plants. Uh, you know, it's chippy. That chippy redwood, they let it decompose, it really doesn't decompose, and then they grow plants and it, it doesn't decompose that very fast that way either. It holds up a long, long time. So those two companies, uh, the plants are surviving, plus one more who did the same thing, redwood sawdust. Um, but the other companies we got the plants from are using bark, uh, which is the main thing that they use now because it's more, more of it's what's available. So at sawmills, there's a lot of fir trees and pine trees that they can use to make wood, and they can't use the bark for anything, so they grind it up and make a growing medium out of it that works well for five months. So now the problem with the industry, the other problem is that most nurseries, you know, if they're not in California, not in southern Florida, not at the very southern tip of Texas, they make sure that by this time of year, all the plants that they purchase from the wholesale growers in spring are gone. Because within a month from the end of September, they're going to freeze to death. So if you're in Missouri, you got to plant a pot, you better get it out of your nursery because it'll freeze before, you know, it'll freeze before it dies from root rot. It'll freeze to death they don't have any, you know, the only way to keep it from freezing is to either put it back in the ground somewhere or put in the greenhouse, but they'd rather just get rid of them and sell snowblowers the rest of the year. So they don't see the problem because they've gotten rid of all their plants. We get the same plants and the second year they're all dead, unless we fix them. So we end up fixing, you know, we, we buy, on display on nursery, about two thirds is what we've grown. <laughs> In actuality, what we sell, about half what we sell is what we buy in. And I don't mind selling a plant that I know won't rot. Even though the dailies look better if they're in better dirt, they never die in the sewage that the growers use. So I don't mind selling that. I don't mind selling the canna lilies because the canna lilies not only sit in water for an extended length of time, they travel. They move out of the root ball, so they're out of there. So two years later, when the soil is really toxic, they're in some place, some other place. So this plant, I don't mind selling either. Uh, we don't mind selling things like conifers; they don't seem to care. Palms don't seem to care. Roses even don't seem to care. Um, but we have to grow our own gardenia because we don't know of a single grower who doesn't use ground up bark as a growing medium. And their gardenias all turn yellow and, and die within a couple of years. So we grow, it turns out that gardenia is one of the easiest plants in the world to grow. You break off the tip and stick it in our potting soil, the darn thing grows. It's just they won't grow if they can't breathe. And so, you know, like one grower, they sell these gardenias that are grafted on, that are grafted because their roots will die in the bark they use. They put it on this wild gardenia rootstock that can handle the bad soil better. It's like, come on. All the nurseries used to grow plants in almost pure sand. Um, now, the way the industry, what happened, so initially, like in the 50s, my dad grew everything in this soil, but you know, pots that were this big were over 100 pounds. 
pots that were quote five gallons were that would be about 50 60 but they were heavy so they had they wanted to, the the universities to figure out a way to make sandy loam lighter so they were supposed to use peat moss and sand half and half and i know caltrade fullerton still likes that mixture and it works peat moss um, is not related to anything we grow, so it's even though it's dead, it's not it doesn't have any. Well, they say peat moss doesn't have any disease in it. Plus, it's antibiotic because it's been buried in the peat bog for how many years? Ten thousand years before they dig it up and, and use it. So it's real old. It doesn't decompose fast. It they said it decomposed in about five years. Um, so peat moss is and peat moss seems to be safe in water. It's been sitting in the lake forever. So you put in water, the water does not get stinky. So that's that's the criteria I use. If you put in water, it doesn't stink, it's probably fine. So it was supposed to be sand and peat. Well, sand is actually a little expensive, and peat is actually quite expensive because it's got to be shipped. So and you know what they tell you about using coconut instead of peat because they're they're apparently there's not enough peat bogs in the world and there's plenty of coconuts. <laughs> like half of Russia is a peat bog and half of Canada is a peat bog. How are we gonna run out of peat? They said they're using one lake in Canada to get all the peat moss for the US. It's like we're not running out of peat. But they're promoting coconut because uh, people in uh, India and Sri Lanka need jobs. So they're promoting coconut for it. But coconut doesn't work as well as peat. It does cause some trouble, but it's not the coconut shells still don't decompose that fast, so it's not so bad. Anyway, so it was supposed to be sand and peat, but because of the price, the university came back and says, okay, uh, it's okay to go one third sand, one third peat, one third fur bark, which is the bad stuff. But at one third, it wasn't bad. Well, later, uh, so that was in the 60s, and it worked for the 60s and 70s. We didn't have too much trouble with our plants. Starting in the 80s, we started losing stuff. And I think that's the time when nurseries are discovering, hey, if we grow pure bark, the plants grow faster. So the universities were promoting it too. And my dad called the egg agency, or the egg, um, yeah, the egg, inspectors because we were losing plants left and right in nursery because when I was a kid my dad told me growing plants is easy you water them once a day and you fertilize once a month real simple so 50s 60s 70s watered everything every day in the 80s things started rotting and the egg department came in and told them you're crazy you can't water your plants every day you're rotting them you're watering too much so my dad was real puzzled he goes well the last 30 years I've watered every day you figure out so he I was in the nursery business by that time he says you figure this out I can't figure it out what's going on in the nursery business so it took us 10 years to figure out that it wasn't the water it was the soil that they were now using that they had told us to use so so in the early 90s uh, we figured it out um, no one else seems to have figured this out at all. Well, there's one nursery in Northern California, Las Palitas, that on their website, you look carefully at some parts of the website, they said, why aren't nursery plants being grown, being grown in their old earth? It puzzles us why they're using things other than dirt to grow plants in. But uh, that's, and I heard there's one guy on the East Coast who's, who's got the same opinion that I do, and that's it. The rest of the industry is in wood. Now, there are still nurseries that grow great plants in the ground and dig them up and ship them. And it used to be most of the country was the same. They couldn't grow plants in containers because anywhere north of Southern California, Southern Texas, Southern Florida, all the container plants would freeze. Well, somebody in the 80s discovered, hey, you dig a hole in the ground, you drop the container into the hole in the ground, it doesn't freeze. So now all the everybody's growing plants in containers in holes in the ground. They put a they put an empty pot in the ground and they drop the plant into it and it won't freeze. So 
So they asked California, well, what soil do we use in these pots? So California said, oh, pure bark. So now everybody's stuck with the same problem. Everybody's going to plant some pure bark. Uh, the plants that are really easy are succeeding. A lot of the big trees, conifers, palms, roses, lilies can work in that pure bark. A lot of stuff just rots. So what do you see in people's houses? You see palms, you see junipers, cypresses, lilies, roses. You don't see many gardenias uh, or English lavender. Well, that thing rots really bad. So it's, it's a big deal, we think, but nobody else seems to recognize it. Um, so hopefully, information get passed on. Now, so one thing you can do is fix the plants that you have. So I can demonstrate what we do. Now it's, it's, it's really eye-opening when you do it. So this is a Bougainvillea <laughs> growers group. See, that's typical what you see. So once we change the dirt on it and put it back in the same pot, you'll notice that the leaves tend to get a lot bigger. And the plant just looks more vigorous. So the original leaves are the same as those. That was like that. And then the new leaves we get, once we get them into what we think is proper soil, are massive. You just take off the roots and then put in the... Yeah, it's, you know, the, when I was first introduced in the nursery, when I first joined the nursery industry, they told me, never touch the soil in Bougie as the roots are so yeah. delicate, hair-like, and there's very few roots in there, you don't want to touch it. Now we're telling people, you want to get rid of that soil, they don't like it. That's why they have no roots, because they hate the soil that they're growing in. So you gotta get rid of it now. One of my, I had a new employee a couple of years ago, and I had him plant the bees by our, our pillars out there by the entrance ways. I told him, you take this plant, there's one of these actually, the golden one, shake off all the dirt and plant the ground. He says, he looked at me puzzled, he says, I'm gonna kill the plant. I told him, nah, don't worry about it. Just do it and watch what happens. So he did it, it was, you know, this time of year, a few years ago, so it was pretty warm. And in three days, all the leaves fell off. He says, look at the plants. I said, no, that's what plants do. When they're, when they're lacking water, they drop their leaves to save themselves. If the leaves hang on their brown, the plant's dead. If the plant's dropping their leaves, they're, they're doing it on purpose to save themselves. So we actually did cut the plant down with I'll show you what we did. So it wasn't too many leaves on it. Keep us a little cleaner in here. So on average during spring and summer and fall we're changing soil and maybe 20 or 30 plants a week and we've been doing it. We've been doing this for like 20 years now. <laughs> Just taking plants we want to sell to customers and fixing them. Now a lot of our customers know how to do this now because they've done it. Now the method I'm going to show you I didn't invent. I, what I was doing was using a, essentially a chopstick. Now I was taught this by soil scientists not connected with any of the California universities because they all believe in using compost. But a NASA scientist coached me in the early 90s and said, what's wrong with your industry? They don't, they don't know what dirt is. And at that time, I didn't really know either. I was listening to everybody else. So I listened to this guy because I was frustrated. So what he did is he said, let me demonstrate to you what, how bad soil is. So he had me take a plant and get an ice pick and start picking the dirt off like this. He said, just watch the plant. And after about a half hour of watching the plant, I noticed the leaves went from like this, they went like this. 
couldn't believe it. The plant looked like it was holding its breath in the soil. And as soon as you get the stuff off it, the leaves go like oh, that. <laughs> it was just amazing. I'm going, okay, this, this stuff is poison. The plant's trying to live in that and it can't breathe. So, you know, so he demonstrated that he wanted me to see that firsthand that the soil was a, a big problem. So in, he was working for NASA and they were sending plants up into the space shuttle in spun glass. And they said, what's wrong with your industry? You're using ground up trees. He couldn't believe it. And he couldn't convince any professors that he was, that NASA was right. Like, they don't get it. They all have to look at the re You know, I was told by University of California, I can't teach my view on soil to their students because I don't have the research that proves it. It's just, it's just, you know, it's almost getting to the point where it's like, what's that fable, um, Emperor's New Clothes? They can't see it. So anyway, so I was doing it that method because that's what he was doing, but I told my son to pick some plants and I hear this banging noise and going, What's my son doing? He was dropping the plants on the ground. I'm going, well, you're, and that thought was gonna, I was going to go over there and yell at him and tell him you're killing everything. But I just wanted to see what would happen. So he was doing citrus trees and just dropping the root balls on the ground and shaking them out. Like, it took me like 20 minutes to get this off with the knife pick. It took him like two minutes to drop it on the ground and get the dirt off. I was going, well, that's a lot of faster. Let's see if the plants survive. Didn't lose a single one. So we're going, okay, that's a better method. <laughs> so, uh, this, now this table's too soft, so it's bouncing. If this was uh, concrete, it'd be a lot better, or the asphalt. <laughs> yeah, it is bouncing. So, what you have to do is watch the big claws coming off. You don't want them to tear off too many roots. You kind of break up the big claws so they don't, they kind of break up before they fall off. If you lose half the roots, it's not a big deal. You don't want to lose all the roots. If you lose all the roots, or almost all the roots, you've got to cut the top quite a ways back, or pick the leaves off so that it doesn't go too bad. I did it once with the citrus tree, and just put it out, plant out in my garden, and it was June gloom at that time, but the sun came out a few days later, it was 80 degrees, and all the leaves fell off, but they grew back, and it was fine. But even if the leaves, so if the leaves fall off, you haven't lost anything. Oh, sometimes if you take half the leaves off, it never does. They'll hold on to the rest and you'll be ahead of the game. So let me go ahead and cut this back a little bit. So generally what we want to do is get rid of all the flowers because they're using a lot of energy to bloom. So we'd rather have the energy to grow the leaves and roots back. And when I want it to grow, I don't want it to be huge right off, so we'll cut it back so it's, it will match the stake better once it regrows. <clears throat> now in the nursery when we do this, we often don't trim them at all, but we have the advantage to put it back in the same pot and you put the plants in half a day of shade for two weeks. And so you don't have to lose any leaves. Um, two weeks to recover from manipulating the soil like this. That's kind of the general rule on plants. If you disturb the roots, it takes two weeks to fully recover. And then we put them back on the sun, they just get going. Of course, um, they don't nip the roots, the soil that fast. So usually if I do this with this bougainvillea, take it to our growing ground, set it there for a couple months, and then bring it back. And then it looks like that. This was done at our last soil class. Uh, I forgot to put the date on it. It was probably about two months ago. And you can see how much it's regrown. -ish. The roots, I would think, are not quite knit yet in there, but it's sure a good plant now. To hold the soil together, so when you pull it out of the pot, it's together. It's together. So, but, you know, you can put that in the sun. Um, there are methods where you can put it in the ground without pulling it out. You just cut the container apart and then put it in the ground and it's fine. But, uh, this was a firmer 
surface would work a little bit better. Last time I did this, I had a piece of plywood here, and plywood is a lot more, a lot less bendy. So it's working a little better. So I'm trying to break up the little clods that are forming on the outside here so they don't break off. This is not the worst soil I've seen from a nursery. This is uh, Valley Crest, and there's a lot of sand in here. They still use a lot of compost, though. And what that does to bougainvilleas, so you see a number of bougainvilleas in the neighborhoods that are evergreen and bloom throughout the year. Then you see a whole bunch that drop their leaves and flowers for the winter. And when they're in too much compost, that's what it does to the roots and puts them to sleep. And we think that the reason, and so this guy here, will not go to sleep this winter, it'll bloom all the way through and have leaves. This one, if I didn't touch it, would just drop all its leaves and look dormant. And we think what's causing that is that the roots cannot live in the center of the root ball because there's no air there. They're just on the outer side, but the outside is exposed to too much cold in the winter. Mm -hmm. So the roots are actually freezing and it puts the plants to sleep. They go through cycles. Okay. Flowers last a couple months and then they drop them. They're not really flowers, they're grass. So. Does it matter if you leave the grass around the bottom of the bougainvillea? Does it affect? Well, the bougainvillea, they were meant to drop and stay there. Okay. So they, the plants drop their leaves so that they get the nutrients back. Okay. They never hurt the plant. It seems like the biggest bougainvillea I see are the ones that just have left wild. Well, yeah, a lot of green belts have good bougainvilleas because the green belt growers aren't worried about good looking plants. So a lot of times the people who grow for green belt just grow plants in just pure dirt without any compost in it because they don't really care. They just want to have a plant in a pond. So they do the, quote, the worst dirt, which turns out to be the best dirt. <laughs> so a lot of green belt plants look pretty good because they did not put compost in their soil. This is actually a, a grower that does sell to green belts a lot. They do a lot of plants in big volumes. If you shake, vibrate it, sometimes that helps too. Just wish your cable were firmer. Yeah, so when we first started doing this back in the 90s, we just used water the most gentle way. So we would just hose it off. And I'd be using thousands of gallons of water every day. <laughs> yeah. Now we don't do the water thing because it does use, our, this nursery is too small. I, I'd have a lake out there <laughs> real fast. Our old store, we had more land. You must not want this soil that's coming off of this now. No, this is uh, half, uh, probably close to half organic matter. And you just kind of throw it away or? Yeah, you can put it thinly over the top. You can, you know, as a surface mulch, as long as it's not too thick, it's fine. Uh -huh. If you add sand to it, would it work, the sand? No. No, there's, you can't bury organic matter at all. Oh, it's just, see. you don't want it in the ground. So this, I didn't talk about that. So the soil and nature, they, I mean, the U.S. Department of Agriculture got around, the National Geographic got around the world to check how much organic matter is actually in the ground. It's, um, the average over the entire world is 0.9%. So it's less than 1% organic matter in the ground, and most of that is dead roots. What is your um, topic next week that you're saying? Watering, fertilizing, mulching, crop rotation. Okay. So we'll talk about all the other things other than dirt next week. But uh, the University of California checked the farmlands in California in 1950 and found out they were 0.9% organic, which is what nature is. 
and they went around and checked in the year 2000 to make sure the farmers hadn't messed their soil up. And they said, perfect, we're at 1.1% organic. That's perfect, they said. They did mention that there are some farms in California that are on reclaimed marshland in the Delta region, 40% organic. They said in those, in those farms, they can only grow quick annual crops and they have to manage their watering very carefully because things rot real easy on that heavy organic matter. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people I've met who come from back east, they said, yeah, our yard had an area that was 100% organic, it was called a peat bog. Mm -hmm. Nothing grows in that at all. <clears throat> said nothing ever will, they said. <laughs> a peat bog is the, is the totally useless part of the garden. So 100% uh, organic doesn't work. So the farmers know this. Now you've seen how the farms put organic matter, spread it out and turn it in. So they know that they're limited to about five cubic yards per acre. So if you spread five yards over an acre, it's about that thick. And then you turn it in so that the farm is about 1% organic. Um, that's it, that's how much they do. Um, University of Washington knows it very well because they said, yeah, if you farmer puts too much organic matter around, everything's rotting. They just cannot put that much. And even for the public there, like I was looking at a bag of miracle, well, let me say the name, potting soil, garden soil, which is mostly ground up wood. In the state of Washington, they do not allow more than five cubic yards of that material per acre per year. Because if you put that in your garden, that more than that, you're gonna kill off everything for a long time. So they know what organic matter does to the soil if you amend it in. You just leave it on top, it's fine. The average depth of dead leaves on top of the ground across all the areas where plants grow is five inches. And there are some that are much deeper than that. So a friend of mine went down to Guatemala, he wanted to see what it was underneath the wild avocado trees. He said, we're digging through five foot of dead leaves before we hit the dirt. <laughs> and those trees want that there. They don't want it. You know, we're losing a lot of root there. Some plants have lots sturdier roots than others. I mean, when we're doing citrus, those roots are like wire on those cords. They, they're real firm, we hardly lost anything. This one we're gonna lose about 60%. So I'll make sure this goes in more shade. Now you can't go in total shade because the plant won't get any energy to regrow the root system. So you gotta make sure it gets some sun during the day when it's recovering, but just not too much. Because full sun would make it lose too much water? Well, it'll drop its leaves. Uh -huh. I'd rather keep the leaves that it has. But it won't, you know, so it won't kill it, but it'll set you back a little bit. So that's good enough. Um, and then what we do, there's a lot in the box there. <clears throat> okay, so we like our top pot. Top pot is our permanent potting soil. So what it is, two-thirds of this uh, won't break down. So it's one-third peat moss because we wanted to, I don't know, I wouldn't mind selling pure sand. You know, pure sand works great as potting soil. We did our test in the early 90s in pure sand and that beat everything. Pure sand is the best potting soil and always has been. Um, all the old textbooks will tell you, like when they did the orangeries in France in the 1800s, those citrus trees and those huge pots were in pure sand. Or they said 95% sand. My dad's bonsai textbooks, and bonsai has been done for thousands of years now. I said, 
No, we want to slow down the plants. You have to add some clay to the soil. But if your plant ever got runs into trouble, starts rotting pots, you take it out of that soil and put it in pure sand so it recovers. Mm. So they all know that stuff. What's wrong with the U.S.? So why don't you sell pure sand? Because nobody can lift it. <laughs> I mean, if pure sand, this bag was pure sand, it'd be a little over 100 pounds. No one's going to want it. And plus, it's too light. People look at that, you know, they'll see this and they'll look at our sand and go, that can't be potting soil. So we made so we made this one third peat, which looks brown because of the peat. Um, so we so we this this is our main potting soil. Now it doesn't shrink. The um, let's see if I have a plant here. Dump it. So you've got some sand in there and some potting. Yeah, it's, there's a little bit of sand. We couldn't with this kind of material bag. You can't put too much sand in so the so our manufacturer limited us to 10% sand unless we wanted to go to a paper and plastic bag or you know a much heavier duty bag. Uh, and we didn't really want the weight anyway because this is heavy enough. Yeah. This is 50 pounds, 40 to 60 pounds, depending on how much rain we're getting. Uh, so it's heavy enough. It's it's pretty hard for people to lift it. So it's uh, peat moss, pumice rock, uh, sand, perlite, and charcoal. Now we like charcoal. Charcoal is totally inert. It's organic, but it is the only organic matter that won't break down ever. And charcoal is what makes the world's uh, rich black soils rich and black. So the the, um, the guys who wrote had an article in National Geographic about 10 years ago said that uh, the rich black soils of the world have a natural charcoal content of one to two percent. And it's from, uh, it's, it's not ash. So ash is when you take a tree and totally burn it, plenty of oxygen, it turns into ash uh, and it disappears totally, pretty much. Charcoal is when the wood is kind of caramelized, so it's heated up real hot, but not enough oxygen to turn it, to oxidize it. So it's still basically carbon, uh, and not carbon dioxide, but uh, it's just too hot and it no longer, nothing eats that form of wood. Charcoal, nothing eats it, nothing breaks it down. But what charcoal does do, and why it's used in filters, is because it attracts all the minerals to it. So, and, and a lot of organisms like to live near charcoal in the ground. So charcoal is what makes rich black soil a little black. And they said only one, two percent makes the soil look black. And they haven't figured that out at all. Um, but you hear a lot with the uh, journalists, they'll tell you, oh, add a lot of compost to your ground so it makes it rich and black. Well, if you do that, it's because you've created sewer gases, <laughs> which are totally toxic. In fact, most nurseries know if their soil mixture turns black, they have to discard it. The plants won't grow in that black stuff. But they've done that to the soil. Charcoal is the only way to properly make it turn black. So what we usually do here at the nursery is to write the date that we did this. So we know how soon we can put it, take it out of the shade or semi-shade. I gotta reverse this, I'm right-handed. Try to distribute the soil between the roots. Now this is firm enough; it'll do it. Sometimes roots hang straight down. It's almost better to put a mound of soil in the ground or in a pot, and then spread the roots out over it so they're not so close together because they need room to breathe. Put the roots in there. Put the soil around. Now in a pot, the advantage of putting this back in a pot is I can make the the soil um, distribute better because I can shake it. If it's in the ground, you can't do it. You can't shake it in the ground. So I shake it to get the soil nice and distributed better. When you water, 
started to settle about a half inch, and then it, from that point it won't change anymore. And then we used to throw some fertilizer in it too, because it'll want to be growing its, its uh, foliage back in a hurry. You just threw that right on top. That's it. Well, you're supposed to dig it in. <laughs> if I don't put it on the top, and I turn my back and look at it again, I go, did I put fertilizer on that one? <laughs> oh, okay. So I'll have to dig through it to make sure I did. So we just throw it on top now. It buries itself in the water. So that's the procedure. And now, do you use osmocote? We like to use osmocote here because it works faster. Now, next week we'll talk about why organic fertilizer is generally a little better. But uh, for our own purposes here, you know, it works immediately and it lasts six months. That's what we're looking for. And plus, they did, you know, plants need 13 minerals added. This has got 11 of them. It's pretty close to being perfect, as good as any organic fertilizer. Now, organics have the advantage that they power the soil too, so the soil stays fluffy. So, uh, organics are actually better in the long haul. And what do you think about the, uh, the, the spear start from the big stone that has the mycorrhizae in it? That's an excellent stop. Oh, okay. Mycorrhizal fungi are essential. They're all over the place. Um, generally, if you work in the ground, you don't have to add it. If you have a plant that's going into a pot that's never seen, like if you're planting a seed in a pot, it's nice to add it. So it gets there quicker. But, uh, you know, Consumer Reports had articles in the late 90s about mycorrhizal saying how snake oil it is because you, never, you don't need it. It's all over. Now this particular plant, and flax plants have the same problem. They, this is cordyline, they rot real badly. And they keep trying to find new plants that look like flax that won't rot, and they're not finding any. So they're, they keep finding them, and then they try them for a while, and then they rot and die, and they find another one that looks like a flax plant, and it keeps rotting. So, you know, they just, for some reason, the industry just won't go back to its roots. <laughs> Well, some plants are real fast. Like this one, generally, because it's on the cement, it's less than a minute to take it off. It's just that we have to hold them for two, well, for two months before we can sell them again, two to three months, depending on the plant. It's because you have to make sure it's going to run. It's going to hold together. It's already garden ready within a few weeks, but, or sun ready within a few weeks, but it's not consumer ready for a few months. Because it's not knitted. Right, it's not knitted together. The smaller the plant, the faster they recover. Now, plants that look like this, the best thing is for us to do is to make sure there's no shock, and then we can tell how they're doing, to cut off the top. You do the same thing when you're working with bearded iris, you just cut the leaves back, and grasses, do that. You put this right out to the sun, you can put this right into your garden, because with only half the foliage, it's got enough water from this root system, and then you'll know the new growth is coming out, and you say, okay, it's doing fine. Otherwise, you've got to, you know, like on palms, you see them a lot of times where they tie the leaves together. Mm -hmm. So that's one way, because palms are dug out of the ground, they're transported, they tie the leaves together, they don't use as much water, and then the twine breaks off within three months, and then we're fine. Uh, grasses, I like to do this. Grasses, uh, lilies, uh, this is cordyline. If you love this plant, this cordyline, uh, Colors are just incredible on it, but uh, the plants do rot fairly easily. This big one is rotting. You know, all those brown leaves on it, so that's got to be changed too. Some plants are extremely sensitive, so the most sensitive we've seen so far, because like this one, at this point, in fact, a lot of the plants. The growers actually get them from propagators who grow them in real tiny pots. And the soil they use is usually peat moss and perlite, which is fine. So the very core of it is fine. You can leave that alone. It's just what the growers put it in that you have to get rid of. But I remember once we got in hundreds of lavender plants of different kinds, and it turns out that English lavender is really sensitive because the, the, the propagator we used was growing them in brown bark. Uh, which is fine for you know for a short period of time, 
we did not lose a single Goodwin Creek Lavender, which is a French hybrid, or the French or the Spanish. <coughs> we lost 76% of the English Lavenders because a little bit of bark in there just messed them up. So English Lavender, we still consider to be English Lavender and English hybrids. We still consider them to be the most sensitive to compost in the soil, and that's what it does to them. It is brought out at the crown, uh, and we don't have a single grower that does them right. Um, now, when we grow an English lavender from seed, the seed, the plants are like hair when they first come up. But what we found is that in our soil, either the admixture or the top pot, we cannot kill English lavender when it's grown in the right soil. We, we throw in the corner, not water for a month, nothing happens. Water every day, nothing happens. It's really a strong plant when it's grown in the proper soil. Of course, that's the same with most plants. When they're grown in the proper soil, or in reasonable soil, they're really strong. Is that why you choose English lavender because it is so strong once it's established? Or is it, how is it different from French or Spanish? Well, it stays, people want English because you can use it for culinary purposes, number one, and it stays about half the height. So most lavenders grow three to five feet. English lavender goes to one to two, uh, 18 inches, two, two feet. So it's much smaller, but boy, it is sensitive. It doesn't want anything rotting around its core. And we don't know how to, we don't know if we can fix any of these uh, because it's just a small amount will rot them. You know, if that root ball we were getting into that one grow puppy was less than two inches wide. If that, if it's that small amount, how do you fix it? So you just have to find a better propagator that uses, you know, just peat or something, you know, uh, no one uses anything better than peat and perlite that we've seen. Well, some growers use pure peat. If it's a real small plug, they won't hurt them. Because peat, pure peat, because we used to grow like blueberries. Um, that's another plant people lose a lot of because the growers were told to plant them in pure bark. So within two or three years, they're turning yellow and dying. Um, so we started growing our own blueberries and put them in our acid mix soil, which is half peat and half pumice, and they do, they do quite well in there. That's one of this. Um, but yeah, you have to be careful because a little bit of, of compost can still ruin them. So. Okay, so this one's now done, and this can go straight out to the sun with this hairdo. Because the water usage on that is pretty, pretty low. Most indoor plants are coming to us in pure peat now. It's pretty weird. And this has got a few flakes of wood in it too. But I think they do that because peat moss holds water better than stores water for plants better than any material known. So among, I'm talking about the materials here. So among the materials, clay holds water the best, but it won't give it up. Plants can't suck it dry. Whereas peat holds a lot of water, not as much as clay, but the plants can totally suck the water out of it. That's why we use peat moss as part of our mix because it's a good water storage medium. But when you go 100% peat, uh, as the peat decomposes, it starts getting a little sludgy and the air can't get through anymore. So you need something permanent in there. Oh, that's what I was saying. So when I first started growing blueberries, we were told to put them in pure peat. So I dug a hole in the ground in my yard pure peat moss, put the blueberry plant in there, and for the first year it's wonderful. But by the third year I noticed it's going lopsided. And what had happened was that the soil wasn't draining that well, and I was watering a lot because blueberries like a wet. Well, it was a little pond of peat, and, the, and this blueberry plant was floating in it. So it didn't kill it, but there was no real dirt there. The peat had turned back into a, a pond kind of thing, or a marshland, <laughs> and it was just, so I just pulled it out and put it in a pot after that. But uh, so pure peat is not good enough as a soil, but we found that if you make it half, our acid mix is half peat, half pumice rock. We've grown plants in water and that, like, you know what cyclamen are? They'll, they rot real easy. And that was one of the first tests we did. We had our acid mix, cyclamen in acid mix, sitting in a deep saucer of water about two inches deep. Bloom beer around for seven years in that setup. Wow. Didn't have to go dry at all. It was just in the water, in peat and pumice, 
and it was perfect. We sold it after seven years, and we were kind of hesitant, so I want to see how long it would live. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so you got the tool right, based upon the questions. So you don't use vermiculite at all? Vermiculite is clay. Oh. So it's man, it's kind of expanded clay. So vermiculite would be a substitute for the peat moss. So that would be a good one to, for us to use. We're thinking about doing that uh, in our next soil mix that we do. Uh, every 10 years or so we make a new mix up to see if we can make it improve uh, the conditions for it. Because vermiculite would never break down. Whereas peat eventually disappears. Uh, so note, when we use our, ask, our top pot, our permanent one, we notice that the soil level doesn't shrink at all over the time. It could, even though the peat moss is, is disappearing, it doesn't seem to shrink. We think uh, at 60% or two thirds volume, two thirds volume of permanent material, the peat moss isn't really contributing to the volume of the soil. It's probably a little, you know, peat moss is like chopped up around here. So we think it's sitting between the, the, the rocks. So even though it's there and it's disappearing, it's, the soil is not shrinking because of it. Uh, either that or the plant roots make up the volume. One of the two. Also, thank you. Okay. Anything else? The right phone or the phone? Oh, okay, go over some of these materials. So um, the Netherlands or Holland does a lot of research for their growers because most of the economy is based on growing stuff, either flowers or vegetables for Europe. Um, so they did an extensive study on, because you know, Europe invented wood pellets. So they got all this wood that they got to get rid of, this old wood. So they said for two years, they tried to make a growing medium out of used pellets, used wood. Couldn't do it. They said you can't make growing medium out of used wood, even though everyone in the US does it, or bark, they said, because wood's not uniform enough. They said a piece of wood, a piece of bark, one part of it may decompose in two weeks, another part may last for years. It's just not uniform. Peat moss, they said, we know what it's gonna do. It holds water. It's a good growing medium for about one year, then it becomes sludge. It loses too much permeability after a year. Coconut core is pretty uniform too. They know it's good for about six months of growing plants and before it goes sludgy. Wood and bark, they said, they cannot make it work. Uh, rice holes, another one, a very uniform material. Rice holes, 90% uh, silica. This stuff doesn't decompose at all. So uh, now, I asked our suppliers if they can mix this into our soil. They said, no, we don't like rice holes because you open them up, the big bales, and it blows all over town. It's just too light. So we can't use rice holes, but rice holes will work as part of the growing medium because they're almost pure silica. Charcoal, the only problem with charcoal, so charcoal is like the holy grail of, of the recyclers because if you can turn everything to charcoal, you can turn all your green waste into the most, the best soil you can by turning to charcoal, the energy it takes to do that is just too high. But there are some places, you know, like Vietnam, labor's cheap, things are cheaper there. In China, they're, they're making a lot of charcoal out of uh, agricultural waste so they can just put it back in the ground and make the ground richer. It holds the minerals better. So charcoal is good. Cost is um, one cubic foot bag like this, $50 wholesale. So very priced. That's, you know, we should, that's why our top pots cost more than mix by a dollar because uh, it's actually more than that. The, the price of putting 5% charcoal, we should have made it 2% like nature, but or 2.5% maybe, but we made it 5% so you can see it. But that's the whole cost of our top pot, is the charcoal price. So rice holes, charcoal, peat moss, coconut core, are all things they said organic that you can use to grow plants in and know what's gonna happen. The bark and wood, they said no, no. But everyone in the U.S. and as far as nurseries goes, uses this, those materials. And we've had nurseries tell us that they had a bad batch of bark and lost all their camellias. It's like, I just don't understand why they don't use something else. So anyway, they also said uh, um, 
for sand is used in hydroponic growing or greenhouse growing. Pumice, which is this nature made um, volcanic rock, and then perlite, which is man made volcanic rock, same all same material, silicon dioxide, are all used. Um, rock wool, which is this minerals that are extruded, so it's like wool, that's real popular. Plastic foam is even used for growing plants. Don't you need the rock wool in floral arrangements? Yeah. And then clay pellets are like the thing. They're the most highly advanced growing medium for hothouse plants is clay pellets. It's clay, but it's in beads, so it holds moisture, kind of holds some nutrients, but it's in beads so it can breathe. And so in the hothouse industry, the most expensive, the most viable crop, they use the best growing medium. So if you go into a well-run uh, marijuana operation, you'll see this. They're using this to grow the marijuana plants in, in the uh, indoors. Yeah, I haven't priced it recently. In fact, in our uh, catalog, there's no price on it. You've got to call because we get the price changes so much. Because it's, it's, it's fire, so it's got to be priced. But, it's uh, fire. Okay. The clay is fire. So it's not just raw clay. It's yeah. It's so it makes the water, I, in my notes you said that the clay doesn't make the water as, a, as available to the plants, but this one would because there was air as well? Yeah, I mean, it, this is better than this as far as holding water. Uh-huh. And, and it breathes just as well because it's fired in the bees. Right. It breathes because it's such a big space in between? Right. So it, it, it's supposed to be the best growing, you know, the fastest growing medium. The fast plants will grow faster here than just about anything, as long as you water it enough. I mean, in hot houses, they water sometimes every couple hours, sometimes every few minutes to keep the plants moist. And this makes them breathe, you know, the air, water, and they also pump carbon dioxide into the greenhouse so they get more carbon dioxide. You said all the world's plants are growing faster right now because of all the carbon dioxide in the air. Okay, so that's, uh, I think that's everything. Any questions? Um, one more, in a conventional soil class, you're going to hear about humus all the time. You know, it's definitely humus. Well, right humus, now. now one definition, oh. This is a good product. So it's humic acids, which is leonardite, which is actually a kind of charcoal like, well, it's coal. So, from the edge of a coal deposit in Texas, they get this stuff. It's not good enough to be coal, but it's good enough to sell the plant industry. It acts like charcoal in the ground. So, that's good material. That actually makes the soil hold minerals better. Uh, nothing negative about humic acids in this form. The other humic acid you can get. You know, essentially, humic acids are the byproduct of decomposition, supposedly, but uh, is uh, lignin. So you can buy liquid lignin, which is the glue that holds, that glues soil particles together and make it more beady, or more uh, granular. So you can buy that material. I've seen lignin that you can spray over your yard and everything beads up. And this humic acids, which is cheaper version of charcoal. I don't know if it's exactly as good, uh, it's you know plant material that was buried in Texas 20 million years ago, something like that. So it's been heated up, it's inert, but it makes the ground hold minerals better. John and Bob has their own version of this that they promote, and it does work. And you, you sprinkle this on top of the ground, the top of the ground turns green because it holds the minerals right there, and the algae starts growing. <laughs> it really hangs on to nutrients. So it is, it is a good thing. We that are backyard go dormant during July and only for a week. And, uh, and now when we're trying to shake them off, when I water, I notice that there are big cracks in the ground. What makes that happen instead of the issue? Well, if your ground is cracking, that just means that there's a lot of clay in it. So it just shrinks when it dries. And If you can afford that much, I mean, again, there's nothing really. I mean, plants grow in clay as well as they do in regular dirt. 
they wouldn't hardly grow in it though. There'd be like one root every six inches or so to move through this stuff. When I replaced it with sand alone, we dug it up three months later to see what the roots were growing and there was a root every quarter inch from the sand alone. So that's like 25 times more roots in real dirt than in the stuff that they were selling us. And we can't believe that, you know, all these soil companies they still sell that kind of stuff. Topsoil with half, 40 to 60% compost. Why people's yards? They just, um, they must think that people are trivial or willing to take the blame for the bad growth. Well, no one knows what's going on. No one blames anybody because no one knows what's going on. Everybody thinks they're doing the right thing, and and you know the soil companies know tractors and dump trucks. They don't know anything about plants. The grass will grow on it still. The rose will still grow on it. Uh, a lot of vegetables will grow on that. Their vegetables have been cultivated for so long that they've selected the ones that can put up with stuff like that. But uh, a lot of good stuff just perishes immediately. <laughs> Deep on top, don't mix it in. I mean, there's, we'll talk about it next week, but there's some farms in the Pacific Northwest that no till, don't till, and they have uh, 12 inches of mulch on top of the grow their uh, row crops, and they have 18 inches to grow their tree crops. So that really is perfect. No weeds. You get no weeds when it's that deep. Yeah. And how do they grow? Is it because they're planting the Oh yeah, they pull the mulch side, plant them, put the mulch back as the plants grow. Right? And they don't start their plants in that stuff. They won't start underneath the mulch. They have to start it elsewhere and then put it in there. Most farms buy seedlings that are this big in size. Right? close to being identical, but the top pot won't shrink. So if I'm, I'm putting something I don't want it to ever move at all, and I'm not going to replant, like a vegetable garden, a lot of people use their acid mix. It's a dollar cheaper a bag, and they're replanting it over and over, so they don't care if it shrinks a little bit. Our top pot doesn't move, so uh, for a permanent shrub or tree, I'd rather use that one, because you're going to use it. But again, you can use the native soil. There's nothing wrong with native soil as long as you know how, you know, what's wrong with the plants that you're putting into it. You mean what type of soil you might have to remove from it? Right. Because, you know, back in the 60s, when my dad planted his yard, it was half solid clay. Nothing died. We didn't have the, the same soils back then, so if you planted anything in the clay, everything would up. Nothing died. It's just when they changed in the 80s to all this bark and stuff to grow plants in there, everything dies in clay now. You filter in sandy soil though, they can make it because they can breathe better. But compost and clay is a bad combination. And here they're telling everybody, oh, you fix your compost by mixing it with clay, uh, fix your clay by mixing it with compost. That's the worst thing in the world you can ever do to your clay, is mix compost with it. It won't decompose properly. All right. garden's lifetime. See, when I was digging out that soil that was 40% compost, I can still, after 10 years, I'm still digging out. We still went growing, and uh, it still had this odor to it, and it still had a funny color to it, too. If it was a real wet spot, it was turning black, but in the areas where it wasn't overly wet, it still had a different color than the native soil. You know, the native soil was kind of blue-gray, White, really. And this compost and stuff was kind of brownish. And uh, yeah, it had an odor to it. And they tell me, the compost team will tell me, well, if you slightly low on oxygen, they make acids, all smelling acids. And if you're really low on oxygen, you get sewer gases, which is really stinky. It plays up and turns black. So I can tell by the smell of the dirt what, what, what was going on in my garden. So, how did mulch? Mulch is anything that's coarse from the ground that sits on top. So you can have rock mulch. You can have bark. You can have, you know, fine, finely graded compost. That, you know, anything that's coarser than the ground.
but it's not soil is would be considered a mulch. Sorry, Mr. Cat. Wood chips. Wood chips. Yeah. Wood chips are fine. Just not in your mm -hmm. And just don't bury that dead stuff in gerbil pits. Okay. Uh, sandy loam. And sandy loam is dirt cheap. And where'd you find it? Uh, I got it at the bulk, the pulp of the building materials. Uh, they call it fill dirt. Some places call it fill sand because it's almost pure sand. Um, you know, when you fill a hole in a, in a yard, you don't want to use clay fill because it expands and contracts the floor. The one thing that doesn't expand and contract the floor is the sand doesn't expand and contract. So this is essentially dirty sand. They didn't take all the clay out of it, uh, but there's not enough clay to make it shrink or expand. So fill dirt, fill sand, sandy loam, there's a lot of different names for it. Sometimes there's a lot of rock in it, so you have to be careful. Sometimes the quality of it's not quite as good as some others, but uh, that's what you, you know, it is really cheap. Uh, if you have, if you know anybody with a pickup truck, you don't have to have it delivered, because when soil is delivered, it's like $100 for delivery. But the soil itself, one scoop of soil, which is supposed to be half the yard, but it's actually more than that, is, uh, when I was buying it, it was like $15, it's probably about $20 or low 20s now for a scoop, which is like 18 cubic feet. That's a lot of soil, and it's cheap. Now, if you move, want to move soil around, uh, first thing I used was a wheelbarrow, because that's what we were taught to use, and it turns out that's the worst thing in the world to move dirt. Why? Is all the weights on your forearms. Oh, oh. <laughs> your forearms go numb after a few hours, and your shoulders, all the weights right there. You get a dolly, and you stack containers of soil on your dolly, and you're pushing down on the dolly to push it. There's no stress at all. Like, it took me 10 years to figure that out. <laughs> that dolly, you can go all day with the dolly, you can only go a few hours with the wheelbarrow, because your arms go numb on you. You lose all the feeling in your arms. So, uh, I mean, the only place where wheelbarrows have advantages is you have no pavement at all and your, and your walkways are too narrow, but you get those little narrow dollies, fill buckets of dirt, stack them on the dolly, you can move quite a bit of dirt that way and there's no strain at all. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. trees or yard, that's one thing you have to be aware of, that you can't put them in the same soil twice. I've never had them. Oh, maybe they were. You mean in the old days? Right. Well, if there was an avocado tree within the last 10 years in any part of your yard, you wouldn't want to plant an avocado there. Okay. okay. You're fine. That's, that's one of the next week's rules, uh, crop rotation. You have to rotate everything. Well, I was thinking of putting it where that raised bed is, and I guess I'm going to have to undo all that. It wouldn't act uh, if it's thin enough on the surface, it does. But, uh, yeah, it's too thick. You'll, if you take it down to about the knees left, you'll probably get Hello. Yeah. Yeah, I I've gotten to the point where I just let grow what 
So the Mexican um, people is really paid. Uh -huh. They don't have to sell bulbs in my front yard, in my front garden. Okay. I will let you.